All right, Shalom, Shalom Israel. First and foremost, I would like to give all praises, honor, and glorification to the Most High God, Yahweh, Hashem, Hamashiach, Malach, Yahweh Shai. Yahweh is the name of the Heavenly Father, who the world calls God, and Yahweh Shai is the name of his beloved Son, who the world calls Jesus Christ, whom is the Savior of the nation of Israel, his brother Malachi out of the WFI Detroit camp. Today's lesson is cutting up the Trinity doctrine. All right, so we're going to go into some history pertaining onto the Trinity doctrine. We're going to see if that's actually factual, and we're going to see if these things are documented in the scriptures. And what we're going to find out are that these things not, so like these things are not in the scriptures, right? This is all Christianity. This is paganism. This is idolatry, and this is wickedness. And these are the things that our people are caught up in, whether it be the Northern tribes within the Catholic church, whether it be the Southern tribes within the Baptist church, right? All these different churches are teaching our people lies and things that's not in the scriptures, things that's contrary to sound doctrine. Let's get precepts. Let's get 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse four. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse four. I start at verse three. It say, but though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, right? So why did Paul say we walk after the flesh, meaning we are in these mortal bodies, right? As it states in Romans, the seventh chapter, as it states in Ecclesiastes chapter seven and verse 20, we was made subject to vanity, to sin and to go off because we was made in these mortal bodies. So though we walk after the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, meaning our war is the spiritual war. It's a war for our spirit, right? It's a war for our mind, for our well-being, for our sense of security, right? It's a war for all these things. Verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Yahweh to the pulling down of strongholds. So the weapons that we use are not carnal weapons, right? We don't tell our people go take up a guns and arms like the Black Panthers did in the 70s. No, we tell our people repent and come back to the laws of God. And this is how you war after the spirit, right? You take the spiritual things to war after the spiritual things, right? You're not gonna take a bow and arrow, a gun, a goddamn knife to war after a spirit that you can't see, right? So you gotta take the spiritual things to war after the spiritual, right? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Yahweh and bring it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Hamashiach. So the scriptures say we have to cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of the Lord. And these are different doctrines that attempts to exalt itself against the knowledge of the scriptures. So again, these things were issued in to cause massive confusion on the earth. These things were issued in to keep the Israelites away from their power, to keep the Israelites in a puzzled, in a perplexed state of being, and to keep us away from the knowledge of the Lord. All right, so we're gonna cut up this Trinity doctrine. And we're gonna find out are these things actually biblical? Let's get Romans chapter 16, verse 17. the book of Romans chapter 16 verse 17. Now I beseech you brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. So we have to mark those that cause divisions within the doctrine, right? The Roman Catholic Church brought about a lot of confusion and paganism in the scriptures, man. And this is why a lot of our people, they shy away from the scriptures, they turn down the scriptures because it has been so like it has been so much lies placed on the scriptures. And they say, the Lord said, mock those which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. But they that are cert such serve not our Lord Hamashiach Yahawashah, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. And the scriptures also say the simple believe of every word. Let's get that in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. So that's another dynamic that our people have. The spirit of believing in every word. 
just because your Christian pastor, Thaddeus Matthews, told that the Trinity is real and that it's a, a concept that's known in the scriptures doesn't mean that he was right. He can't validate it with scriptures. He can't back it up with historical evidence of these things because he's not speaking the word of the Lord. He's speaking out of his own belly. This is Proverbs chapter 16, verse 15. So like in Proverbs 15 and 16. So like in Proverbs 14 and 15. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15. The simple believe of every word, but the prudent man look of well to his goings. Right? So when you come to serve the Lord, you have to look well to your goings. The scriptures say you have to bethink yourself. The scriptures also say study to show yourself approved in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Also in the book of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. Bring that out. It states, the heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. So if you're a righteous man, you're going to study to get the answers. Right? You're going to go into these scriptures precept upon precept, and you're going to link these things together as in a puzzle, and you're going to put the pieces to the puzzle, and you're going to find out that the Trinity doctrine is not in the scriptures, man. You're going to find out that your Christian pastor lied to you. You're going to find out the ways in which you was brought up in are contrary to the ways of the Lord. Let's get Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 10. This is Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 10. It say, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. Now, this is going into <clears throat> the leaders of the nation of Israel, right? You know, we look to the pastors as the leaders of our people. We look to Creflo Dollar. We look to Thaddeus Matthews. We look to T.D. Jakes. We look to Dan Mace. He used to be a rapper. And then he kind of stopped being a rapper to become a pastor. They say, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. So the Lord called the pastors of the nation of Israel dumb dogs. And a dog is an unprincipled person. Read on. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. So the Lord called the shepherds and the leaders of the people greedy dogs. Right? And again, a dog is an unprincipled person. Right, dogs, when you read 1 Kings, the 21st chapter, the dogs licked the blood of Ahab. Hey, the dogs ate Jezebel. Let's get that in 1 Kings, chapter 21, verse 23. Right? It's not just pork that's unclean. You also have the dogs. Whether it be a German shepherd, a Rockweiler, a, a puppy, right? A boar mastiff. All these dogs are unclean creatures, right? They don't have parted hoofs. They don't chew the cud. So on and so forth. So this is First Kings chapter twenty-one, verse twenty-three. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, "The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat." And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. You see that? Right? So this judgment, the Lord brung upon Jezebel and also upon King Ahab for the wickedness, for the violence in the land. So this is showing that dogs are filthy beasts. Right? So the fact that the Lord called these pastors dogs, that's the Lord calling these pastors unprincipled men. Let's get that in Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 11. This is Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 11. This is Proverbs. You also have 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 and Revelations chapter 22 and verse 14. Going down. This is Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 11. And it reads thus. 
as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. So again, you got dogs that will literally eat anything, whether it be a rib by steak, a pork chop, right? A, a, a scraps, right? So they eat all these different things. And once their stomach is full, they vomit these things out and they lick it back up. And that's the spirit of these pastors. That goes to show you the greed of these pastors. They got all this wealth, the riches, the money, and they kind of vomit it up. And then they kind of lick up the vomit, right? They found $600,000 in the walls of Joel Austin's church. Let's get another one. Let's get Psalms chapter 59 and verse 14. And at evening, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. And that's what these pastors do, right? They wander up and down for meat for money, and they kind of get mad if you don't pay the types. They grudge if they're not satisfied, right? So this goes to show our people that you got to come out of these churches that's lying to you, that's teaching you false doctrine, that's leading you astray. Let's get that in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 16. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 16. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. That's playing upon tables. Right? So now let's get into it. Are you also got Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 23. You got Acts chapter 17, verse 24, pertaining onto the church houses and how the Lord doesn't require us to physically go to a church to worship them. You can worship the Lord from the comfort of your own home. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, Aquila and Priscilla had a church that was in their house. Right? So uh, this is the introduction. It say many people assume that God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from what is commonly known as the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is usually summed up as a belief in one God existing in three distinct but equal persons. But did you realize that even though it is a common assumption among many sincere Christians, people, the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible, right? And just to be clear, the name Trinity, so like the name Christian comes from the Greek word Christos, which means a follower of Christ. So the real Christians are Israelites. And they say the word of Trinity, so like the word Trinity does not appear anywhere in the Bible. In fact, the word Trinity did not come into common use as a religious term until centuries after the last books of the Bible were completed and long after the apostles of Christ were gone from the scene. Could the Trinity doctrine have pagan origins? And let's look up that word pagan. All right, bear with me. Pagan, pagan, pagan. A person, Salaki, a person holding religious beliefs other than those of the main world's religion. Bear with me. Heathen, infidel, idolater, idolatrous, atheist, non, non, non-theist, irreligious person, agnostic, skeptic, heretic, apostate, panum, relating to pagans. So a pagan is pretty much an unbeliever. 
Let's get Psalm chapter 14 to verse 1. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 14, and verse 1. And it reads, The fool have said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that do of good. Right? So only a foolish person, only a corrupt infidel will proclaim that there is no power. Right? Through the works of the, the Lord, for example, the trees, the fowls of the heavens, man itself, that shows the power and that shows the existence of Yahweh Shmiyahu right? But a foolish person and an infidel and a pagan is not going to fathom those concepts. Let's also get 2nd Edges chapter 8, verse 58. 2nd Edges chapter 8, verse 58. And it reads thus. Let's start at verse 57. It says, Moreover, they have trodden down his righteous and said in their heart, that there is no God, yea, in that knowing they must die. So the Lord said these people must be put to death. All these pagans, all these infidels, all these heathens that don't adhere and try to discredit the power of the Lord, the Most High said they have to be put to death. Also those that add on to the word, right? And that's also in Deuteronomy chapter four and verse two. And I mentioned that because it say, in fact, the word Trinity did not, Salakia. Yeah, it say, in fact, the word Trinity did not come into common use as a religious term until centuries after the last books of the Bible were completed and long after the apostles of Christ were gone from the scene could the Trinity doctrine have pagan origins. So these are new doctrines created on our earth. And let's get that in Proverbs chapter, Salakia Deuteronomy chapter four and verse two. Because what did the Lord say about adding their two into the word? It's a Deuteronomy chapter four and verse two. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your power, which I command you. So the Heavenly Father commanded us not to add on to the word. So that's what these false pastors, the Roman Catholic Church, have done throughout history and time. They have added to the words of the Lord or attempted to add on to the scriptures and bring about falsehood and lies upon our book. So it's a... Bear with me. They say is the Trinity doctrine in the Bible. The New Bible Dictionary goes in to explain that the formal doctrine of the Trinity was the result of several inadequate attempts to explain who and what the Christian God really is. To deal with these problems, the church fathers met in AD 325 at the Council of Nasir to set out an orthodox biblical definition concerning the divine identity. And that's what the Council of Nasir was about, right? They were discussing the nature of Hamashiach and Hawasha, right? Because you had different schisms throughout the Roman Empire, right? This is when Rome was pretty much on its last leg. It was falling. It was going downhill. You had different schisms throughout Rome. You had people discussing the nature of Hamashiach, all right? And then it also say, However, it wasn't until 381 at the Council of Constantinople that the divinity of the spirit was affirmed. So the Council of Nasir added pagan origins to the scriptures, right? And this was pretty much to appease the publicists and to appease the people of Rome so it wouldn't be uprisings of the people and schisms. It say, while Tertullian introduced the term Trinity, what he taught and believed is different to what the Trinity doctrine is today. And since he introduced this term, then that means the Trinity doctrine that's taught today did not exist in the time of Tertullian. And if it did not exist in its time, then it could never have existed in the time of Christ and the apostles. Tertullian, however, did introduce pagan ideas into the worship service. He taught oblations for the dead and made the sign of the cross on the forehead of worshipers. 
much, which is also wicked because the Lord said, don't print any marks upon you. Let's get that in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 27. Book of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. It say, ye shall not round the corners of your head, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy bed. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. Right? So we are not to print marks upon us. We're not to make crosses upon our head, print crosses about our necks, tat up bless on our arm. All these different things are abominations. So all these different pagan things came after the Lord was off the scene, right? The Lord, you know, pretty much was ascended up and died around three, uh, 33 AD, all right? Now he's sitting on the right hand of the Father as it states in Colossians, the third chapter. And after his departing, you had wickedness in the land. You had false doctrine, false pastors rising up. Coming, Salak is saying they're coming in the name of the Lord. But really is all deceit. And the Lord warned us of these things in the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter. Let's bring that out. This is Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Right? So the Israelites, chiefly the disciples, they always inquired about the end times. That's also stated in Acts, the first chapter. They asked the Lord, when would thou restore the kingdom of Israel? So all throughout history and all throughout the scriptures, you always had the righteous ones that desired to know the day of the Lord and to know the day in which the Lord is coming back to judge the earth in righteousness. And here's an example of that. Let's read on to verse four. And Yahweh shall answer the said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. So that's the first thing the Lord told his disciples. Take heed that no man deceive you. They say, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And that's what's happening. We got many coming in the name of the Lord, right? Tertullian, again, stating that Tertullian freely admitted that he adopted these ideas from pagan teachers and could not support them from scripture. But he thought that if Christians adopted some heathen rituals of the pagans, that they would find it easier to join Christianity, which is wicked, huh? right? You don't water down a doctrine. You don't trim your ways to seek love and attempt to gain more followers. Let's get that in Jeremiah chapter two, verse 33. There's no way that you can water down the scriptures and the doctrine of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shah. This is Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 33. It reads thus Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. Right? So you can't trim your ways to seek love. And you can't come with a deceitful spirit, as it states in Romans chapter 3, verse 13. And that also falls in the lines of bearing false witness and lying one to another. This is Romans chapter three, verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips. Now this is pertaining to the so-called white man, but it can also go into these false and wicked pastors and these so-called church leaders. They say with their tongues, they have used deceit. Even when it comes to teaching a doctrine, they use deceit. Here it is, they know the truth, but they still water down a doctrine and they still push out falsehood and lies for the sake of gaining members for their congregation. Right? And that's why the Lord said in the book of First Timothy chapter two and verse so like first Timothy chapter six and verse nine, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Because all this is for the sake of money, greed, power, which the Lord is against. The Lord is against a man trying to get to himself the preeminence. The Lord is only dealing with the humble and lowly in spirit, as it states in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 and Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. He's not dealing with a proud and greedy man. Right? Let's get another one on lies. Let's get Proverbs. 
Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 24. So lock you. Let's get Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 14. This is Proverbs chapter 2, verse 14. It reads thus, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. Right? So these different pastors and also Esau, they're froward in their paths. Let's get Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 30. Right. And for those who don't exactly know what the word froward means, we'll look it up. Froward. Of a person difficult to deal with, contrary, stubborn, headstrong, willful, unyielding, unflexible, unbending, intractable, obdurate, mollish, strong willed. Right. So pretty much rebellious. That's what the word froward means. And the Lord said rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Let's get that real quick in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For the rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he have also rejected thee from being a king. So you want to beware of frowardness and stubbornness. As it states in Job chapter 34 and verse 37. This is Job chapter 34, verse 37. It reads, For well, he addeth rebellion unto his sin, he clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against Howard. And this is exactly what Tortillian did. He added rebellion onto sin. He knew the truth, but for the sake of gaining followers, he lied and he put out a, a, a falsehood on the scriptures. Let's read that again. Tortillian, however, did introduce pagan ideas into the worship service. He taught oblations for the dead and made the sign of the cross on the forehead of worshipers. They'll say he taught oblations for the dead. That's necromancy. That's witchcraft, as it states in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, Exodus chapter 22 and verse 18, Matthews chapter 22 and verse 32. As it states, the Lord is not a God of the dead. Let's get that. This is Matthews chapter 22 and verse 32. It say, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Yahweh is not the God of the dead, but of the living. It's plain upon tables. All right, so let's read on. All right, because that can go into a whole nother topic, getting on these false church leaders. Tertullian was just a forerunner of the Nicene doctrine and did not state the eminent trinity. He used Trinitas, Latin, threeness, emphasized the manifold character of God. In his treatise against Persexes, he used the words Trinity and economy, person and substance. The Son is distinct from the Father and the Spirit from both the Father and the Son. These three are one substance, not one person. It is said, I and my Father are one in respect, not the singulatary of number, but the unity of the substance. In his book, Tortillian against praxis, he also states that the son was not, not co-eternal with the father and did have a beginning as the begotten son of God. He also did not teach that the Holy Spirit was a literal being. So the Trinity doctrine as we know it today did not even come from the man who introduced the word Trinity. So the doctrine of the Trinity was formalized until long after the Bible was completed and the apostles were long dead in their graves. And long after the man who introduced the word Trinity was dead and in his grave, it took later theologian centuries to sort out what they believe and to formulate the belief in the Trinity. By no means are theologians' explanations of the Trinity doctrine clear. Let's keep reading on. Let's go to pagan origins of the Trinity doctrine. 
It would surprise many to know the absolute beginnings of the three in one Trinity doctrine goes right back to the Tower of Babel in the plain of Shinar by the river Euphrates, many generations after the flood. At that time, at the construction of the Babylon at the Tower of Babel, mankind had multiplied and spoken one language. And you can read about that in Genesis, the 11th chapter. Cush, who was the son of Ham and grandson, so like a grandson of Noah. Right, and Salak and Ham was born about 96 years after the flood. Right, and you can read about that in the Zondervan Bible Dictionary. And also in Genesis, the 10th chapter, helped to plane with his son Nimrod, a way to rule the world through a wicked, counterfeit religion. Nimrod was the originator of sun worship and founder of Babylon. The Targum says Nimrod became a mighty man of sin, a murderer of innocent men, and a rebel before the Lord. Right, and a lot of different pagan things goes back to Babylon. For example, Christmas goes back to Babylon. When you read Jeremiah the tenth chapter, right, and also Jeremiah the seventh chapter, Easter goes back to Babylon. Right, the worshiping of Talmus. Right, Ezekiel the eighth chapter, sun worship goes back to Babylon. Let's get that in Ezekiel chapter eight verse fifteen. Right, and the word Babylon means confusion. Right, and Babylon was also known as the land of confusion. Let's get Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 15. It say, Then said he unto me, As thou seen this, O son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. So these men, they worshiped the sun. And that's where you get the whole idea of going to church on Sundays from, which is a form of sun worship and paganism that stems from ancient Babylon. And it has been adopted and inherited by modern day Babylon, which is America. Right. So reading on. So the beginning of Nimrod's plan had its origin of Babel, which was later known as Babylon, the city of Babylon with a tower whose top may reach onto heaven. Right. Reading on. Was built by Nimrod, Genesis, the 10th chapter. They called the tower Babel, the gate to heaven, but God called it Babel. Confusion. Right, because all these different doctrines, these different understandings, these ideologies, these philosophies of Babylon, it's all confusion. Right? So it say, but God called it Babel, confusion, and there confused the language of the people which forced them to scatter. These people wanted one government to rule the world and one religion to sway the hearts of man. And these, so like these philosophies was also inherited by the so-called white man. Chiefly Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Let's get that in 1 Maccabees chapter 1 and verse 41. Right, Esau has no culture. As it states in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2. Right, so he adopts, or he inherits all these different understandings from kingdoms that came before him such as Babylon, Egypt also. This is 1 Maccabees chapter 1 and verse 40. And as had been glory, so like you, let's go to verse 41. 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 41. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrifice to idols and profane the Sabbath. So again, he wrote to, to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. And this goes to show you the rebellion of the so-called white man, because the Lord is not with all people coming together as one. The Lord is about separation. Let's get that in Genesis chapter 10, verse 32. All right? This is Genesis chapter 10 and verse 32. Genesis chapter 10, verse 32. It say, 
These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So the nations were divided throughout the earth after the flood. All right, so reading on. This was Satan's attempt to defy God and his authority, but Yahweh, or it say, but God came down and stopped this rebellion and defiance of his command for mankind to replenish the earth. Now the Lord, Yahweh Yahweh himself didn't come down. He sent angels down there to confound the languages of man, right? The Lord is not going to get off his throne to come among earth. Right? So let's skip to the point. So you got these different pictures right here that all correlates and co-signs with the Trinity. So you got Saramses and her priests of Satan were deep into the occult and were masters of lies and deception. Everywhere there were statues or idols of this mother child cult. So Ramses was son, so like so Ramses was soon held as the queen of heaven. Ishtaroth, her symbol became the moon and her husband Nimrod was called Babel, the sun god, and hence his symbol became the sun. Now, let's get Judges chapter two, verse 13. Because our people became caught up in these evil things when you read the book of Judges. After we dwelt, or after we came into the land of Israel, we began to wax mighty as a nation. We begot wealth, riches, knowledge, understanding. We began to become proud on the earth. We magnified ourselves against the Lord. We started going out to other gods. And one of those gods in particular was Ishtar, the queen of heaven. So this is Judges chapter two, verse 13. And they first, I started 12. Judges chapter two, verse 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were around about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served for all in Ashtaroth, that is the queen of heaven, right? And the pagan Ephesians called the queen of heaven, Diana. So um, let's get Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. Judges chapter 10, verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. So Israel, we went into paganism, idolatry, and the worshiping under sun, moon, stars, and the constellations thereof. Hence, Sir Ramses, the mother child, the queen of heaven, and all these different matters. It says, so we find that the Trinity has its origins all the way back in Babylon. If the Most High had not interfered and confused the languages, then we would have had no hope of any truth that we have today. We also find that this worship of three was carried to all different cultures that we have today, but they took on different names since God had confused the languages as we find in Genesis the 11th chapter. So in Egypt, their Trinity became Osiris, Horus and Isis, top left. In Greece, it was Zeus, Apollo and Athena, top right. And in India, there was Brahma. Let me read that again. So with Egypt, their trinity became Osiris, Horus, and Isis, top left. So this is Osiris, Horus, and Isis. And in India, Salaki, and in Greece, it was Zeus, Apollo, and Athena, top right. So Esau adopted these cultures and traditions in Greece. Right, and the Greeks came in power around 331 BC. 
right, during the Battle of Gargamela, right, in which they conquered the Persians. It say in India, there was Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, bottom left. So you got the Elamites who also adopted these traditions. Notice also the left, so I can notice also the yellow halo around their heads which represent the sun god. The system of Rome adopted the same symbol where you see saints with a halo around their head. Most tend to think that this means they are holy, but it actually represents the sun god. And speaking of Rome, they had Jupiter, Mars, and Venus bottom right. Jupiter, Mars, and Venus, bottom right. Now, there's no account in the scriptures where the angels having halos about their heads. It's not in there. Let's get that in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 5. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 5. Daniel chapter 10, verse 5. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of youth fast. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Right? So Yahweh Shah and also the angels are so-called black men. Right? They don't have halos about their heads, right? They're not little white babies to look as, look up, you know, look that of alfalfa. No, that's not in the scriptures. So this different paganism is all wickedness and it's not documented in the Bible. These things are lies of the heathen, right? Right, so again, that's the origin of the Trinity doctrine Babylon, you have more history on it, but we're not going to get the whole thing, right? Let's read a little bit of this. The origins of the Trinity doctrine into the church. They say, so now we know the absolute origins of the Trinity doctrine but very few understand how it came to be accepted by the church several countries to like in several centuries after the Bible was completed. And as you have just seen, the root go back much further in history. By late in the first century, as we see from 3 John 9 and 10, conditions had grown so dire that false ministers openly refused to receive representatives of the apostle John and were excommunicating true Christians from the church. All right. Pretty much they was putting the, the real followers of the Lord to death, persecuting the church. So let's get some precepts on this. <clears throat> let's get John chapter 14, verse 28. And let's dive into the precepts. John chapter 14, verse 28. It reads thus. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye will rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So if Yahweh Shai and Yahweh are the same people, why did the Lord, Yahweh Shai, the Son, acknowledge the Father to be greater than himself? That would make no sense for them to be the same people if the Lord is acknowledging that the Father is greater than himself. Let's get Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12. Now, you have Christians that may argue and say, well, this is, or well, that scripture was before he ascended up. Well, let's get Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my power. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my power and the names of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out from heaven 
from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Right? So the Lord is acknowledging that he has a power and that he has a God. Now, this is after he ascended up, but the Lord is still acknowledging that there's someone greater than himself, and that someone is Yahweh, the Father, because there's perfect order even within the spiritual realm. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, the Lord created order and ranking in the heavens and also on the earth. Let's get 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, because this shows the order within the household and the order also among the Lord. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I will have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So the head of Yahweh Shah is Yahweh. His father is over him. All right. Let's get Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and I am set down with my father in his throne, right? So the Lord said, look, I'm sitting with my father, chief me on the right hand of the Lord. We read Colossians chapter three, verse one. Let's bring that out. So if he's sitting on the right hand of the Lord, how can they be the same people? Is the Lord sitting on the right hand of his self? So all these things are things you have to ask yourself. This is Colossians chapter three, verse one. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of Yahweh. Right? So that's playing upon tables. It reads that the Lord is sitting on the right hand of Yahweh. Let's get Psalm chapter 110 and verse four. Book of Psalm chapter 110 and verse four. And it reads thus, the Lord have sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his judgment. Let's get verse one, Psalm chapter 110, verse one. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. So the scriptures say the Lord said unto my Lord. So who is David's Lord? Right, David's Lord is Yahweh Shah. Okay. Let's get John chapter 5 and verse 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my so like I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which have sent me. So Yahweh sent Yahweh Shai on the earth, right? To, you know, physically be that embodiment of righteousness on the earth. As it states in John chapter one and verse 14, right? So Yahweh Shai, he was made manifest on the scene to teach the Israelites how to walk on the earth, to teach the Israelites how to properly keep the commandments and be that sacrificial lamb for us for the remission of sins. We read Luke chapter one and verse 77. He was physically manifest to give the Israelites the knowledge of salvation and the remission of sins, right? So nonetheless, he said his father sent him, right? So how can these people be the, the same? Did the Lord send himself or did his father send him? No, we just read in the scriptures that his father sent him. Let's get John chapter seven and verse 16. Yahweh shall answer them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. All right, and what's the doctrine that the Lord spoke? The law, Proverbs chapter four, verse two. He also preached grace and mercy as well. For those who fall short, when you read John chapter eight, verse five, he told that woman, go and sin no more. So not only did the Lord teach the law, but he also taught grace and mercy that was issued in through his coming. We read John chapter one, verse 17. Now let's get John chapter 10 and verse 31, because here's the stumbling block. This is John chapter 10, verse 31. I, so like John chapter 10, verse 30, 
I and my father are one. So it reads again, I and my father are one. So what does it mean when he said, I and my father are one? That means that they are on one accord and they are one body. That's not literal one body, right? Because they're different and separate entities, but they work together as one. Let's get that in Nehemiah chapter eight, verse one. It's the book of Nehemiah chapter eight, verse one. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So the scriptures say all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street, right? Meaning they gathered together themselves on one accord. So when the Lord say, I am my father, I one, and they are on one accord. Get another precept. Let's get Romans chapter 12, verse 5. And it's likewise with us. We are one body. Let's get Romans chapter 12, verse 5. Let's get verse 4. But as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. For example, with your body, you have different limbs. You have your arm. You have your brain. You have your nose. You have your ears. And they all do different things, but they all work together as one, being a part of one body. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another, right? And these are the members that, you know, different brothers may have within its truth. Verse seven, or ministry, let us wait when our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exalteth. So like he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that shew of mercy with cheerfulness. So these are the different offices within the truth. You have certain brothers that's good at counsel. You have certain brothers that's good at prophesying. You have certain brothers that's experts at history. You have certain brothers that's simply good teachers. They're well-rounded in pretty much everything. So there's different offices within the body. But there's, of course, there's different brothers. We're not all the same. We're not all a part of each other, right? But on a spiritual level, we are, all right? So that's, so like, that's the, uh, that's what John chapter 10 and verse 30 means when it states that I and my father are one, I mean, they on one accord. They're not literally the same person. They're two diff different and separate people, but they work together on one accord. Right. And this is why the heathens have, they have, they have no, uh, 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 let's just get in the scriptures. Let's get Psalm chapter 50 and verse 16. Right, they have no reason to have this book in their hands. Right, this is Psalm chapter 50 and verse 16. But unto the wicked, God said, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction and casting my words behind thee? So the Lord said, What do you have to do with the scriptures? Why do you got these scriptures in your hand if you can't understand it? As it states in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 9, the parables. And the Lord only spoke in the parables because he wanted certain people to understand it, certain people not to understand it. That's also in Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 10 and Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8. It was only set up for certain people to understand the word of truth, not everybody. That's also in Revelations, I believe, the 11th chapter. Let's see. Maybe 17. Let's see. Right? Because the Lord said, leave the rest out of the temple. What is given unto the Gentiles. Right? Because the Gentiles have no reason to have the scriptures within their hands. Let 
nice to read. Yeah, Revelation chapter 11. Who was 11? It's book of Revelations, chapter 11. Right, and, and this is not, and real quick, this is not the Lord, man. Right, this is not Yahweh Shai. Right, know this guy kind of been up there, but this is not the Lord, man. Christ is a so called black man. Let's go ahead and get him off the screen. And when you read these different articles, you got to take the meat and spit out the bones, right? Because this is madness as well, right? So you got to take the meat, you got to spit out the bones, you got to use your discernment, right? So this is Revelation chapter 11 and verse 2. This is Revelation chapter 11 and verse 2. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city shall tread, shall they tread down under foot 40 in two months. So when they say measure it not, meaning the heathens have no place in the temple, right? The heathens are not going to receive salvation from the Lord, right? It is given unto the Gentiles, so you have to leave them out. So the Gentiles... In the heathens, they have no reason with these scriptures in their hands. As it states in Psalm chapter 50 and verse 16, because whenever they get these scriptures, they distort it. They add onto the word, they diminish art from it. They come up with their own ideas, their philosophies, and they push out wickedness on the earth, man. And they deceive the Israelites. So let's get Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, the Most High shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So if you add unto these words, if you try to revamp these scriptures, the Lord is going to take you out of the book of life. The Lord is going to add unto you the plagues. The Lord is going to destroy your ass utterly for being wicked and abominable on the earth. Right? And let's get another one. Let's get Psalms. This is Psalms. Psalm chapter 59 and verse 5. Thou therefore, O Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen, right? Because the heathen are the ones that created this idea of the Trinity, right? The Babylonians. So it says, visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. So the Lord is not going to be merciful to the nations of the earth because they are wicked transgressors. Scripture say they will call transgressors from the womb. Let's bring that out in Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 4. This book, Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 8. Let's see. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 8. Yea, thou heardest not, yea, thou knewest not, yea, from that time that thine ear was not open. But I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously. So the Lord knew the nations of the earth would be wicked, as it states in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4, because the Lord created the nations of the earth. So he knew that they would operate in the spirit of wickedness. It says, I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. So these different nations, they are wicked from the womb. As soon as they be born, they go astray. And that's in the classic Psalm chapter 58 and verse 3. Let's get another one. Let's get Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 11. Book of Isaiah chapter 27, verse 11. It says, Then the bows thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he that made them will not have mercy on them, and he that formed them will shew them no favor. So the Lord is not going to have mercy 
don't show favor to the different nations of the earth. Right? So with that, I'm gonna give all praises unto Yahweh, uh, these are the pagan origins of the tradition, so like of the Trinity doctrine. So we just dismantled it through the spirit and power of Yahweh, and Lord willing, you Israelites come out of these different strongholds. Shalom.